Welcome. We are going to talk about the basics of genetics. So let's go ahead and get started. So we have a couple of scientists that we need to talk about. There are a lot more scientists that contribute to genetics and continuing to contribute to genetics. Our first scientist is Gregor Mendel, and he was in the mid to late 1800s, and he really, he was a, a monk, and his focus was the garden pea, and he specialized in math and science, and when he was growing the peas, he started to notice patterns um, and we'll get into those different traits that he really focused on, but he is known as the father of genetics for kind of laying the groundwork for everything. And what he looked at is that he started to see that tall plants would not only produce offspring that were tall, but there would occasionally be some short plants. And so he started looking at colors and height and to determine where are these traits coming from that he was observing? So he looked at seven different traits. The first one was the shape of the pod. Was it inflated or constricted? The seed color, yellow or green. The height, and you'll see that in a lot of genetic problems, tall and short or dwarf. The texture of the seed, round and wrinkled, and that'll be another one that you'll see in several genetic problems. The color of the flower, purple or white. Uh, violet would be the same thing, that would be fine. A uh, pod color, so green and yellow. And then the position of the flower on the stem. So whether it was axial and terminal. And all that means, if it's axial, that means the flower is directly across from one another on the stem. And terminal means at the end of the stem. Few more terms, uh, we have heredity, and that's just the passing of traits from parent to offspring. Pure and strain, pure would be that all of the offspring are identical, not clone identical, but have the same traits as the parents. So it's pure, it means it's not carrying any recessive alleles. Strain, same thing, species for a specific trait, and you really find this term used in plants, whereas pure, you find them more in animals, like purebred dog. Pollination, um, that's when you transfer pollen from the anther, which would be the male reproductive organs of a plant, to the stigma. And we're not gonna get into all the parts of the plant, but a couple that you do need to be familiar with, anther and stigma. So let's take a look at the flower. Here we have the pistil, that is all the female reproductive organs, just like for a human. Uh, you'll notice down in the bottom, uh, you have the ovary, just like the females. And then you also have ovules. Ovules are the eggs. And then for the male part of the flower, that is the stamen, and we have pollen, anther, filament. The filament is what holds the anther. The anther is this structure right here, and it holds the pollen grains. So if I relate that to humans, the pollen would be like the sperm, and the anther is the testicles which hold the sperm. And you can kind of remember that because stamen, men, and those are the male reproductive organs. So plants can either do it self-pollination or cross-pollination. Self-pollination means within the same plant. So you have a lot of the stamen surrounding the ovule, which contains the eggs. And so the pollen would simply drop down into the ovule and fertilize the egg. That's self-pollination. Cross-pollination is between different flowers. And it could be the same species or it can be two different species. And that is the pollen from one flower traveling to another flower and going down and reaching the eggs. And so there's different ways you can have cross-pollination. Insect, uh, like bees, wind can carry it, and even humans, when they try to make a new species and they actually take a brush and will brush the pollen on one plant and brush it onto another plant. Now, I'll be using these terms when we do our genetic problems, and we use symbols. And so our first is parental generation with a capital P, 
And you'll notice I have a, a one subscript, so that's the first parental cross. And then we've got a new term here, filial, filial. And it's with the cap, capital F. And what that means is that it is the offspring from the parental generation. So F1 is the first filial generation. And then I can continue on. Second filial have a subscript two, three, four, etc. So if I keep crossing the generations, then each offspring would be filial, and each time I cross it would be one, two, three, four, five. Now back to Mendel, he really came up with three principles or laws. So we're going to look at each one more in depth. So first one was dominance recessiveness, segregation, and independent assortment. So dominance and recessiveness, he saw that when he was observing the plants that he would have mostly tall plants if he started off with a tall plant, but then every once in a while he would have a short plant. And what he came to find out over several hundreds crosses is that the tall would cover up the trait for carrying the recessive allele. And I'll talk more about what an allele is. So tall will mask the short. So tall was dominant and short was recessive. So some species would carry that recessive a trait. So you can see here, if I started with a short plant and I cross it with a tall plant, then all of the plants from that one generation, the F1 generation, would carry the recessive allele. Then if I cross those two again, then I will start to notice, yes, I'll have three tall plants, but then I'll end up with one short plant because it has the recessive alleles that the other plants were carrying. The second law is the law of segregation. And that goes back to meiosis, when we make the eggs in the sperm. So when I go through meiosis one and meiosis two, and I end up with four eggs or four sperm, each of the egg and sperm will get a different characteristic or a different trait. And it's just on randomness. It just happens to segregate independently of each other. Which leads us to our next law is independent assortment. And that means that traits are not connected. Um, you do have some situations where they do show up together in the same species, for example, blonde hair, blue eyes, but you will have some cases where you will have a child with blonde hair and brown eyes or blue eyes and brown hair. So it doesn't mean that they're always linked together, certain traits, but they do kind of separate out together. So if I was to look at this particular chart, it can go one of two ways. The one on the left, you'll notice that I have some chromosomes that are dominant and recessive, and it depends on how they line up during metaphase one. You will have a gamete with a dominant allele for each or a dominant chromosome for each, and then the same thing on the recessive side. If I go to the right side of the diagram, and you'll notice metaphase, how it's different, how I swapped how the hom homologous chromosomes lined up, when I get down to the gametes, you'll notice then that I've got a dominant and a recessive trait in each gamete. So it just depends how the homologous chromosomes line up on the spindle fibers during meiosis one, or more specifically, metaphase. Our second scientist is Walter Sutton, and he was in the 1900s after Mendel, and he took a look at Mendel's principles or his laws and his observations of meiosis and he came up with what's known as the chromosome theory and what he focused on or discovered is that on those chromosomes that genes are at different specific locations for each trait so he linked and he took the notes from Mendel took very extensive notes and then he proposed and came up with the chromosome theory and for the KU fans out there um, he did go to KU, and he actually played basketball under Naismith, um, which is just a little fun fact. Now, I've kind of thrown out the term alleles, and what that means is alternate forms of the same gene. So if I'm looking at the trait hair color, and the gene location on the chromosome is at the same location, same trait, then that is an allele. So hair color, brown, blonde, genes. I can have different genes, hair color, 
eye color, but the alleles for that is located at the same location on the chromosome. So a gene is a segment of DNA. And when we're talking about a segment of DNA, we're looking at the nucleotides, which we had in our previous unit. And it's an area on the chromosome that's gonna control a particular trait. And if we go back to the previous slide, it would be like hair color. And just like homologous pairs, chromosomes also occur in pairs. So you can have dominant, recessive, uh, you can carry one of each allele, possibly. When scientists are trying to predict the outcome of any cross, they use symbols to represent the alleles. It's a lot easier than writing everything out. So they designate a capital letter is the dominant allele, and a lowercase letter is the recessive allele, as you can see down in the Punnett square below. Now, as I mentioned before, homologous pairs of chromosomes also contain two alleles. You're gonna get one from the father, or the sperm, and you're gonna get one from the mother, or the eggs. A couple of terms that we need to be very familiar with is homozygous and heterozygous. Homo, the prefix means same, so that means that the alleles are going to be the same for the trait. So if I say homozygous dominant, then if I was using my symbols, that would be two capital letters. If I say homozygous recessive, then that's gonna be two lowercase letters. Hetero, the prefix means different. So heterozygous, that means the alleles are different for the trait. So that would be one capital letter and one lowercase letter. And if I was to look at a chromosome, here I can see this would be homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous. And you can see on the gene location, sometimes they'll call it the loci, so these are the alleles, dominant allele, recessive allele, and they match up, so they're at the same location, alleles for that particular trait. If I was to come down here to the chromosomes, you can see they are across from one another, so this would be the dominant, dominant. When I look at heterozygous, then I can see that I've got one capital, one lowercase. And where you get this particular mixing up of genes is crossing over during meiosis. Karyotype, genotype, and phenotype. Karyotype is what scientists use to map out the chromosomes, mainly to determine if there's any disorders. So everything occurs in pairs, so chromosomes occur in pairs. And what they will do is they will extract the chromosome, the DNA, from a cell, and then they will lay out the chromosomes and then start to match them up based on the overall length, the location of the centromere, and then the banding pattern, light and dark, those are the locations of the genes. So if they start to see, since everything occurs in pairs, if they see that maybe one area on this map is missing a chromosome where it should have two, or maybe there's three or four chromosomes at that location, then we're gonna start looking into disorders. Um, our next term is genotype. Geno is the genetic makeup. So in the genetic problems, when we look at genotype, geno, we need to account not only the dominant allele, but the recessive allele. Phenotype is the physical makeup. What do I see? So when Mendel was crossing his garden pea, he noticed for his observations that there were tall and there were short plants. But what he couldn't see was the genetic makeup inside the plant and what was causing those short plants to be exhibited. Now Punnett square is used, and I wanna to stress to predict the outcome of a particular cross. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen every time, but based on several testing, it's the predicted outcome. So if I come up here, and we'll have a lot more practice of this in other problems. So my female gametes are at the top, so I have one dominant, one recessive. My male gametes are on the side, same thing. So when I cross that, I'm gonna bring one down and one across. So this first one is homozygous dominant, the second one, heterozygous, and then you notice that they brought over and put a lowercase a and a capital A. I would stay away from doing that. I would actually flip it around, always put the dominant allele first. That will help you when you're trying to determine phenotype and you look at the first letter. So that's heterozygous and then homozygous recessive. 
So if I was asking the predicted outcome of the cross of two heterozygous parents, 25% or one fourth would be homozygous dominant, 50% would be heterozygous, and then 25% would be homozygous recessive. And just another look at our Punnett squares using the terms geno and phenotype. And again, I'm crossing two heterozygous parents. So genotype, I need to account for all the genes, so I will write everything out. So I have one big B, big B, so homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. If I was to look at the individual, I would only see brown hair, three would have brown hair, and one would have blonde. And ratios for that would be three to one. The genotypic ratio would be one to one. If I asked for a percent, that would be 75% brown and 25% blonde. And that concludes our intro to genetics. And if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.